I did. And um, what Slot's intention to do was to um, uh, present projects and exhibitions that other people didn't do in ways that they didn't do it. Right? To make, to try to uh, make the the uh, uh, the viewing public, the participants, audiences think not just about the uh, work and the uh, the conversation, but to also think about curatorial practices. You know, how could those practices more readily and fully engage the public that they're serving? So uh, as one of the things this slot originally attempted to do. Good afternoon. Our lecture for this afternoon is Jean-Michel Rabatet from Sloat Foundation. He's a senior curator at Sloat Foundation. Uh, Jean-Michel is also a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and an author of Oh, about 30 books. <laughs> and today, he's going to take us to a philosophical journey. And he swears to tell the truth. <laughs> Nothing but the truth. But we don't believe it, because yes. he's, he's going to talk to us about lies. He's going to we, With Nietzsche, we've collaborated by inviting him to one big retrospective in Philadelphia. Then we did something in New York, and we did a book. Now we'd like to continue doing things with him, and things have been better for him as well, since he has a museum in Naples and he's opening uh, museums. Uh, it's a little what we are doing as well. Um, in uh, the case of uh, the previous collaboration, I was very interested by the fact that one of my uh, former students, who is now at Stanford, wrote and is going to write more on the link between Nietzsche and music. What we would like to do, and I thought it would be possible now, but I hope in the future, would be to invite Nietzsche and his musicians to play in the system, in the Greek system in Istanbul. See, to have a real show, but this will take time and money, but when I saw that place last June, I thought this is ideal for Nietzsche. Uh, I will let him do it the way he wants, but uh, uh, knowing what he has been producing so far, I'm sure he will love the, the space and something with maybe only music or maybe a little ritual and so on. Something. So this is one of the projects we would have with Nietzsche in that particular context. When I started my work, they took me in prison. It was 1963 and the next year. So. And now, I would say, uh, all the countries of the world invite me to show my work. And all the people uh, uh, received my work with respect uh, and uh, this makes me happy because we artists, we make our, our work for the human, not against the human society. We do it um, for, the, for the people, we do it for, for the audience. Beethoven did it for the audience. Schoenberg did it for the audience. So, um, we are happy when people understand uh, our work. Anyway, and I would say not the audience has developed. I would say my work has developed. It's becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. And when you, uh, it's not possible to, uh, to educate people that they understand and that they hear Beethoven. No, Beethoven, his work, educated to the people. All this thing works not only with, with the proposal of the art, but also with the consciousness and the risk of the, 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 the presence of the people, how they act. And then you watch the other people, what they are doing. 
and, and this is a common experience. In the case of Leach, and I will say, I'm a from the beginning, when you show the first thing we did today, uh, one of the immediate difference is that the early, early 60 sessions of all the group were for a group of students, a group of people, probably a quarter of the group who is here in the scouts. And then, what is today is almost a spectacle organized by, by, the, by Hollywood, because you have an enormous castle with hundreds of people, with procession, with music professionally played by a band in situ. So, it's a big difference. And I think that he has gone from something very sublime and secret, probably, to something more spectacular, more about entertainment. The last few years researching artists from the 1960s, 1970s, Dennis Oppenheim and others, that were very evasive about documentation. They didn't want their work to be, in a certain sense, to be very simple about it, remembered. Or they wanted it to be remembered, but not in the archival ways that we think today about memory. And I think there's something beautiful about that work that needs to be recovered. I think we've lost sight today of the other ways that you can remember. Maurice Halbox, for instance, famously talked about collective memory. He said that we think of memory as something that we each have. It's, it's what makes us unique. But in fact, he argued that first and foremost, we have collective memories. Right? And those collective memories are the way that we relate to each other. That doesn't necessarily mean they have to be written down. That doesn't mean they have to res result in a physical artwork. There can be equally meaningful ways of creating collectivity and social belonging without having to fossilize or fetish permanence. The most important thing is you have to, uh, you, you, you must be in the performance. Then you can understand it. Also the mu music you can hear uh, much better. And that's the problem about, also about documentation. When I use photographs, a documentation is a documentation. And the real uh, performance is a real performance. And I'm not against documentations, but <coughs> we can bring only a part of the whole thing. Students are particularly uh, well positioned to recreate the kinds of projects that SLOT does. Because SLOT more than anything else, is a body of intellectual entrepreneurs. And students with their energy and their enthusiasm and their new ideas can do that. There's absolutely nothing to prevent a group of students from saying, we are going to, uh, we're going to uh, uh, create a project, we're going to find our own space, we're going to do that project, we're going to publicize that project, and have that project be very, very successful. Because the thing that, that launched SLOT was a refusal to be bound by traditional rules. If you refuse to be bound by tradition, then you can do anything you want. So you don't have to work with SLOT. You don't have to work here at CASI. I mean, uh, that's right. Extremely liberating. It's a lot of work. <laughs> so as always, in our uh, vision, we begin with projects, and the institution follows. Whereas other institutions begin with the institution, and they have a board, they have a lot of money, and then slowly they, they do projects one after the other. When the three of us have spoken about Nietzsche's work just for these few minutes, um, improvising, as, as Valde said, uh, we've spoken about the aggressivity of it and the violence. And the work, when you've seen these pictures, indeed they look, it seems like such an aggressive project. What you'll hear tomorrow when Herman speaks with Osvaldo is that Herman doesn't think of the work as aggressive. He doesn't even think of it as violent. He thinks of it as life affirming. And he thinks of the intensity, the creativity, and the theatricality uh, not as problematic. He doesn't think of it as a negative gesture. He really thinks of his work as life affirming. And again, it goes back to, I think, what Jean Michel was saying about the philosophical conception of this total artwork. Uh, he doesn't really see it to be about contemporary politics. Um, it doesn't seem to register for him again as uh, ethically problematic. Although, of course, that's what Osvaldo is arguing, that you have to think of it in relationship to contemporary issues. All the 
depressed neurotic energies, uh, which uh, uh, have the wish uh, uh, to, yeah, to aggression, to violence. To bring it out in uh, my theater and bring it in our consciousness and the form of art is also very important to bring all this violence and all these sadomasochistic elements uh, in our consciousness and make us free. <laughs>